ratios. A ratio is a comparison between two quantities. You can think of a ratio like a fraction. And since it's just like a fraction, a comparison of two numbers, it is treated a lot like a fraction, meaning you're going to simplify it anytime you can. Let's look at this problem. Suppose a sampling of fish from a local pond contains 12 bass, 8 catfish, 38 minnows, and 4 trout. What is the ratio, so the comparison of two numbers, of bass to minnows? Now, when they ask you this question, they're telling you exactly how to set your ratio up. <clears throat> Since it says bass to minnows, we read left to right. We also read from top to bottom. Since a ratio is a fraction, then they're telling you what your numerator should be and what your denominator should be. So our, our ratio is going to be bass to minnows. And now we can substitute how many bass and minnows we have. According to our problem, we have 12 bass and we have 38 minnows. So that ratio would be 12 to 38. But again, since this is a fraction, we're going to simplify it if we can. And 12 and 38 do have a GCF of 2, so we're going to divide 12 by 2 to get 6, and we'll divide 38 by 2 to get 19. Therefore, our ratio of bass to minnows is 6 to 19. But that's not the only way we can write a ratio. We could also write it as 6 to 19, or as 6 to 19. And these all mean the same thing, and they all give you the same information, that for every 6 bass in the pond, there are 19 minnows in your pond. It is important, though, the order of your numbers. Since the ratio they were asking for was bass to minnows, your bass number should be first and then your minnows number. So make sure you put it in the right order. That is very important. Multiples. You can think of multiples as like counting by that number. So for instance, the multiples of two would be two, four, six, eight, ten, etc. The multiples of three would be 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, etc. The multiples of 4 would be 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, and so on. Sometimes you're asked to find the LCM of two or more numbers. The LCM is the least common multiple. Least meaning the smallest, common meaning the same, and multiple. So if we wanted to find the LCM of, let's say, 2 and 3, the least common multiple of 2 and 3, so the smallest number that 2 and 3 have in common, would be 6. So that's the LCM of 2 and 3. The LCM of, say, 3 and 4, the very smallest number that they have in common would be 12. And you can find the least common multiple of bigger numbers, like, say, the least common multiple of 12 and 15. So 12 would be 12, 24, 36, 48, 60, 72, etc. While 15 would be 15, 30, 45, 60, up. Oh. So if we were finding the LCM of 12 and 15, the smallest number they have in common is 60. So the least common multiple is 60.
Fractions. A fraction is a number that is expressed as one integer written above another integer with a dividing line between them, like x divided by y. So for example, 3 fourths. In this fraction, 3 fourths, the top number is called the numerator, and the bottom number is called the denominator. The numerator is the part that's being considered, while the denominator is the whole. So in this fraction, 3 fourths, we could take a pie shape and cut it into four pieces. That's our whole. And the part that's being considered is 3 fourths. So one, two, three. So now you can see how much of our pie we're talking about, 3 fourths. We can manipulate fractions, and we do this by multiplying or dividing both the numerator and the denominator by the same number, not by adding and subtracting. We manipulate fractions to do many things. One thing is to compare them. If we were to compare 3 fourths and 2 thirds, we would first need to find what's called a common denominator because in order to compare them, I need them to have the same denominator so I can tell which one's bigger or if they're equal. So we'll take 3 fourths and 2 thirds and we're going to find a common denominator. When you do that, you want to look for multiples of the denominators and the least common multiple will be the least common denominator. So the multiples of 4 and 3, 4 is 4, 8, 12, 16, etc. 3 is 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, etc. So the least common multiple between 4 and 3 is 12. So that means I want to change this fraction to something over 12. Same with my other fraction. Uh, what I'm doing is creating an equivalent fraction. 3 fourths is equal to something over 12. So I'm going to multiply my numerator and my denominator both by 3 to achieve that denominator of 12. So 3 times 3 is 9. And for, so our fraction is 9 twelfths. And then for 2 thirds we'll do a similar thing. We want to change our denominator from 3 to 12, so we multiply 3 times 4 to get 12, and we must do the same to our numerator. 2 times 4 is 8. So now we can easily see which fraction is, not, is larger. 3 fourths is a, equivalent to or equal to 9 twelfths, and 2 thirds is equal to 8 twelfths. Well, 9 out of 12 is definitely more than 8 out of 12. So we could say that this fraction 3 fourths is bigger than this fraction 2 thirds if we were to compare them. So let's talk a little bit more about equivalent fractions. All of these fractions are equivalent fractions because they all represent the same value. 2 tenths, 3 fifteenths, 4 twentieths, 5 twenty-fifths, and we could see that they represent the same value more easily by simplifying our fractions. So we said we can manipulate fractions by multiplying the numerator and denominator by the same value, or we can manipulate them by dividing the numerator and denominator by the same value. So if we wanted to simplify this fraction 2 tenths, we would just divide the numerator and the denominator by the same value. Both 2 and 10 are divisible by 2. So we divide our numerator by 2 and our denominator by 2. 
2 divided by 2 is 1. 10 divided by 2 is 5. We do the same thing to our next fraction. 3 and 15 are both divisible by 3. So we divide our numerator by 3 and our denominator by 3. 3 divided by 3 is 1. 15 divided by 3 is 5. 4 twentieths. Our numerator and denominator are both divisible by 4. So divide by 4. Divide by 4. 4 divided by 4 is 1. And 20 divided by 4 is 5. Finally, 5 25ths. Numerator and denominator are both divisible by 5. 5 divided by 5 is 1. And 25 divided by 5 is 5. So as you can see, all four of these fractions are equal to one-fifth. One-fifth is the simplest form of these fractions. And they are all equivalent fractions since they all have the same value, one-fifth. Decimals. Decimals use place value to represent an amount. To read a decimal, like we have here, first read the number to the left as a whole number, followed by and, then read the number to the right of the decimal, followed by the last place value. So this number would be read as 641 and 5,129 ten thousandths. This number could also be represented as a mixed number. 641 and 5,129 ten thousandths. Let's look at another decimal. 5 and 8,139 ten thousandths. We could write this number as an improper fraction by taking the five plus, this would be eight tenths since it's in the tenths place, plus one hundredths, plus three thousandths, plus nine ten thousandths, which would give us 58,139 ten thousandths. So we've seen a decimal in decimal form. We've seen it represented as a mixed number and also as an improper fraction. In math, we have rational numbers and we have irrational numbers. So we're going to be taking a look at rational numbers, which have four different categories, and those are integers, percents, fractions, and decimals. So we're going to define each of these. Even if you're already somewhat familiar with them, we're going to go ahead and define them and give some examples. So starting out with integers, Integer is a positive or negative whole number or zero. So nine would be a whole number. It would be an integer because it's a positive whole number. Negative six is an integer because it's a negative whole number. Then of course zero is an integer because we said it was. And so now we move on to percents, which is kind of a more complicated way to say percent is a part per hundred. So an example of a percent is 20 percent, which we could also write as 20 parts per hundred. But the important thing here is just you know what a percent is, like 20 percent. Then fractions, which is a proportion. So an example would be 20 divided by 10, or 2 divided by 4. And of course we have decimals, so this is where we have an integer, 
maybe 1, maybe 89, maybe 0. And then we have a decimal place, and then we have numbers after the decimal, like 20.53. So we have an, our integer, we have a decimal, and then we have numbers after the decimal. So integers, percents, fractions, and decimals are all rational numbers, usually. There are some rules. So in order to be a rational number, to summarize, it either has to be an integer, like we talked about. If it's a number like 9, negative 6, 0, it's always going to be a rational number. It gets more complicated when we come to fractions and decimals. If it's a fraction, it has to be an integer divided by an integer. And this integer cannot equal 0. So it's an integer divided by an integer. So 7 divided by 4 cuts it. That works. Now, decimals are a little bit more complicated because it either has to be a terminating decimal or a repeating decimal. So an example of a terminating decimal would be something like 2 divided by 4. From that you get 0 0.5. It ends right there at the 5. For a repeating decimal, you do 1 divided by 3, and you get 0 0.3333. It goes on forever. But notice we're getting the same number every time. So really, you could erase all of these 3s and just put a line over the 3 showing it's a repeating decimal. What you don't want is a decimal like pi, where you have 3.1415926, It just keeps going on and on. So it, there's no ending to it, so it's not a terminating decimal. And there's no pattern to it, so it's not a repeating decimal. That's what an a irrational number is, one that just keeps going like this. These numbers, they have basically a stopping point. And so that's what we're looking for. And so the reason I say that a fraction has to be an integer over an integer is because when you divide an integer by an integer, you get a clean number. You get a, a decimal that's repeating or terminating. When you start dividing a decimal or a fraction by a number or a fraction by another fraction, that's when you're going to start getting messy. So really, if you're wondering whether an a fraction is a rational number. What you can do is go ahead and divide it out and then look at the decimal and decide whether it's terminating, repeating, or non-ending. And that's how you can determine if it was a rational number. Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus was an explorer from Genoa, Italy. As an adult, Columbus worked as a trader traveling mostly by sea. So Columbus had a lot of experience at sea. He was an experienced sailor. He had done this for many years of his life. Then he came up with an idea. After many years of presenting his idea, Columbus finally received financial backing from King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, Isabella of Spain in 1492. And this was his idea. He wanted to find a new trade route to Asia, which lay to the east, so Asia lay to the east of them, but he wanted to get there by sailing west. He thought if he started here and went far enough this way, he'd circle back around and hit here. And he would have been right, except that America was in the way. You had two continents, North and South America, that were not going to go away. So his plan didn't work out quite like he thought it was going to. Now, he tried for several years to get people to accept this plan, but since they had just come up with the route to go south of the tip of Africa to get to Asia, people weren't as interested in it. Finally, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain said, okay, we feel like maybe there's an idea here. We'll support you and see how it goes. So Columbus was given three ships for his first voyage. The Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. And he eventually landed near South America. But he thought he had reached the Indies, which is what they called Asia at that time. So Columbus made four voyages in all. 
to what he called the West Indies. So he thought by sailing west, he'd reached the Indies, and he called them the West Indies. He made four voyages there, and he kept thinking he was reaching the Indies. Now, other people didn't think so. They thought he was getting to different land. But Columbus refused to believe that. He held on to the belief that he had reached the West Indies as, as he planned to. Now, he didn't discover a new trade route to the Asian Indies. He thought he had, but he hadn't. But he did discover a new trade route. He discovered new land. He discovered a place that had lots of new resources and that opened the door for exploration and colonization of the Americas. So he is credited with the discovery of the Americas. However, Columbus never would admit that he had discovered new lands. He maintained that he had reached the West Indies. Now he did name some of the islands he found and claimed them for Spain, but he didn't think that he would reached a completely new continent. He thought he had just reached part of the West Indies and he refused to believe otherwise and maintained that he had reached the West Indies until the day he died, which is why possibly the Americas aren't named after Columbus, but instead after Amerigo Vespucci, who actually claimed he discovered new lands whenever he came to the Americas. So Columbus was the first person to get to the Americas. He just didn't admit that he'd done it. The Lewis and Clark Expedition. The purchase of the Louisiana Territory in 1803, more than double the size of the United States. President Thomas Jefferson wanted to have this newly acquired land mapped and explored since most of the territory was considered wilderness. It was unexplored, nobody knew what was out there. They knew Native Americans were there, but it hadn't been mapped out and no one had laid claim to it um, out past the Louisiana Territory. Everything in the Louisiana Territory had just been purchased from France, so the United States did own it, but they didn't know what was out there. So Thomas Jefferson wanted to have an expedition sent out there to explore it, map it out, let everyone know what was out there. Jefferson wanted to ensure America's claim on the land. He felt like if he didn't get out there soon enough with Americans and start settling the land, laying a claim to it, proving that it was their land, other nations like Britain or other European countries would come in and say that they were staking claims on certain parts of the land. So Jefferson wanted to get out there quickly. He chose Meriwether Lewis and William Clark to head an expedition into the territory. The expedition included 33 people and all but one of them made it back. The only one who didn't make it back died of appendicitis. He did not die from anything on the expedition. They traveled from May 1804 to September 1806. So you see they acquired the territory in 1803 and very quickly, in 1804, Jefferson was sending an expedition out to start mapping this territory. And you can see it lasted a little over two years. It took them that long to travel across the Louisiana Territory and come back to where there were known American settlements. They were searching for a water route that would connect the Missouri River with the Pacific Ocean and this was for commerce. If they could reach the Pacific Ocean and they could reach potential new settlements along the river, then it would be easier to transport goods back and forth. So they, Jefferson wanted to know if this was a possibility, so Lewis and Clark were looking for a, a continuous water route. Though the expedition did make it all the way to the Pacific Ocean, they did not discover a continuous water route. So they could go a lot of the way on rivers, but there were the Rocky Mountains in the way and some other areas that cut off one water source from the next. 
So they weren't able to travel continually by water, but they did travel all the way from known American settlements up the Missouri River and some other rivers and then across land until they reached the Pacific Ocean. And they'd gone further with mapping than any other Americans had gone. The expedition did draw a variety of maps. They recorded their encounters in detailed journals. And it, the expedition provided knowledge about the land they had traversed as well as the plants, animals, and people that resided there. So while they didn't discover that continuous water route they were looking for, they were able to bring back a lot from their two-year expedition. They brought maps, they brought detailed journals that were going to help future uh, expeditions and travelers whenever they started heading out that way, and knowledge about plants, animals, and the people, the Native Americans that lived there. So they drew about 140 maps during their two-year expedition. They noted over 70 Native tribes that were along their route, and they recorded more than 200 new plant and animal species. So, while they didn't do everything they set out to do with finding that continuous water route, they did accomplish a lot. They drew these maps, they noted some over 70 native tribes, they discovered lots of new plants and animals that had not been found in America before. And the Lewis and Clark expedition made a clear claim for America in the West, in the Louisiana Territory, and beyond, opening it all up for future expedition, future exploration, and settlement. So Jefferson did accomplish what he wanted to with putting a clear American claim on the land. The Missouri Compromise In 1820, the territory called Missouri asked to enter the Union as a slave state. This would have made the number of slave states 12 compared to 11 free states. So at this time in the United States, a state was considered either a free state or a slave state. If the state allowed slavery, it was a slave state. If the state did not allow slavery, then it was a free state. So most of your free states were going to be up north and most of your slave states were going to be down in the south because slavery was more prevalent in the south. Now, in 1820, there were 11 free states and 11 slave states, so there were an even number for each side of this issue. So if Missouri had entered as another slave state, this would have given the slave states the upper hand when it came to um, voting for different things in Congress. There would be more people in favor of slavery than there were in favor of um, not having slavery, in, fra in favor of being a free state. So, rather than allow this to happen, James Talmadge proposed abolishing slavery in Missouri. So he said, okay, how about we just make Missouri a, a free state? If we make Missouri abolish slavery, Missouri enters as a free state, how about that? Well, that wouldn't have been a great solution for everyone because then there would have been 12 free states and only 11 slave states, so someone's still getting slighted there. So Henry Clay then offered another solution known as the Missouri Compromise. According to this proposal, Missouri would enter the Union as a slave state, but Maine would separate from Massachusetts and become a free state. So Massachusetts was already a free state. Maine at this time was part of Massachusetts. So in Henry Clay's Compromise, Maine separated and became its own state, and it would enter as a free state. Missouri would enter as a slave state as it wanted, and that would change the number of both free states and slave states to 12. Um, you'd have one of each being added, and so that was the compromise. It kept the number even. Each group would have um, the same number of states on the issue of slavery. But, um, Missouri could still enter as a slave state as it had wanted to. Furthermore, everything south of Missouri would be slave territory, 
and everything above would be free. So the Missouri Compromise also lined out something for the future. In the future, anything south of Missouri would be considered slave territory. So if a state was to enter the Union from that area, it would be considered a slave state. And anything above Missouri would be free. So any states entering from above Missouri, uh, any new states entering the Union would be free states. And this pretty much set a precedent as states were added um, that there would generally be one slave state added for one free state. They wouldn't allow just one or the other to join because then that would upset the balance in, uh, in Congress. So they wanted to keep things even and the Missouri Compromise kind of set the stage for that. Now this compromise was satisfactory to pretty much everybody for several reasons, even though the proposed free lands were larger than slave lands. So you might think some would have a problem with this, especially because the proposed free lands north of Missouri were larger than the slave lands south of Missouri. But um, people had their reasons for being okay with this compromise. This was because most agreed that slavery could not be successful in colder climates. So if you move up north, it gets colder. And people thought, you know what, slavery is not going to be that um, successful up north anyway, so it's okay if everything north of Missouri is going to be a free state because slavery wouldn't work there very well anyway. Most of the slaves are working on large plantations. Large plantations aren't going to be able to grow for as many months out of the year further north where it's colder. So this wasn't really something that was going to work as well up north, so they were fine with that area being free. Additionally, uh, many thought that Texas would soon be a part of the United States. Texas was a very large area of land, and it would mostly be south of Missouri. So people thought, okay, Texas will join the Union soon, and then we'll have all that land in an additional state or multiple states that will be considered slave states, um, more slave territory. So everyone was okay with this because slavery wasn't going to work as well up north anyway, and the South thought, okay, we'll be getting more land soon anyway, so it doesn't matter if right now the free lands are larger than the slave lands. So the Missouri Compromise was a solution that Henry Clay came up with in response to Missouri's request to join the Union as a slave state, which would have offset the balance and made the United States have 12 slave states to 11 free states. The Compromise included Missouri getting to enter as a slave state, at the same time that Maine separated from Massachusetts and became a free state. And it also clarified for the future that anything south of Missouri would be slave territory and anything north of Missouri would be free territory. Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation was an executive order issued by President Abraham Lincoln on January 1st, 1863. And this was not something done by Congress. This was done solely by President Lincoln as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. So it did have a certain weight whenever he proclaimed all of this, but it wasn't, only Congress could declare war, and so it wasn't actually Congress saying it. It was just an executive order from President Lincoln. Now, the Emancipation Proclamation freed all slaves in Confederate states that had not ceased rebellion by the beginning of the year. So, Lincoln had issued a pre-proclamation. He had said, I will be issuing a proclamation on the first of the year if by the time that January 1st rolls around, you haven't stopped rebelling, you haven't come back and joined the Union, then you will be subject to this proclamation. And he told all the states that in September. So they had a few months to decide this, but the Confederate states that hadn't ceased rebellion were supposed to be under the jurisdiction of the Emancipation Proclamation. So what it said was that um, all the slaves in those Confederate states were free now. It effectively freed them. 
The proclamation stated that suitable ex-slaves, also known as freedmen, could join the paid service of the United States Armed Forces. So they had to be suitable. They pretty much only took men, and they were going to want healthy, younger men that could actually do some fighting. So suitable ex-slaves could join. They could be paid to be part of the Union Army. Lincoln ordered the Union Army to recognize and maintain the freedom of all freedmen who joined. So even though it's the Union Army, there were still going to be some people who didn't think that these people that had just been slaves a couple months before should be fighting with them. So he ordered the army to make sure that their freedom was recognized and maintained because he was serious about this. And because Lincoln was freeing them and giving them the option to fight and be paid to do so, several of the freedmen did join the armed services. Almost 200,000 black men fought in the Union Army and approximately 10,000 served in the Navy. So this added a lot to the number of soldiers and the size of the army that Lincoln commanded. So they really helped in the war effort. Um, and similarly, the South had lost a lot of the people that had lived there. They lost a lot of their population because even if they didn't follow the Emancipation Proclamation and let their slaves go, a lot of slaves would escape and get over state lines into free states, into what was considered the Union, and then they would be free. And then a lot of them would go and fight against the South for the Union Army. The proclamation also set a precedent for the emancipation of slaves as the war progressed. So as they moved steadily south and they started to control more southern areas, they would free the slaves in those areas. And it showed that ending slavery was a goal of the Union war effort. Lincoln started out just wanting to get the Union back together. Slavery was a big issue, but it wasn't all that they were fighting for. He just wanted to get the Union back together. The South were saying no. We're going to rebel because we want to keep our slaves. The North was saying, well, we don't like you keeping your slaves, but we still want you to be part of the Union. The Confederate States said, no, no, we'll just make our own country and we'll have our slaves over here. And Lincoln wanted to prevent that. He wanted to keep the country together. And so that was what the primary goal was in the beginning. But after the Emancipation Proclamation, a huge goal became freeing all of the slaves and abolishing slavery. So that is all that the Emancipation Proclamation did do. Now the proclamation did not free any slaves under Union control. So if there were, there were some Confederate states that did go back under Union control by their deadline of January 1st. And the slaves in those states were not freed. They were still allowed to be kept as slaves until the end of the war. And so, it, the Emancipation Proclamation did not actually abolish slavery. It didn't get rid of slavery altogether. It only got rid of slavery in the Confederate states that were rebelling against the Union. There was that goal of emancipating slaves as they moved south and, in the end, abolishing slavery. But the Emancipation Proclamation did not do that. It only abolished slavery and freed the slaves in the Confederate states that were not under Union control. And the proclamation did not make ex-slaves citizens. So yes, they were free, but they were not U.S. citizens yet. The Emancipation Proclamation did a lot for a lot in terms of moving forward the goal of emancipating slaves and it enforced that freeing the slaves is going to be a major goal of the Civil War and on the northern side and so that is why it was so important. President Abraham Lincoln showed that he wasn't messing around with the slavery issue if 
the Union couldn't be returned to one whole country, then he was going to free all the slaves in the South and end this slavery thing for good. Now, the Emancipation Proclamation didn't end slavery for good. That didn't happen until the 13th Amendment was added to the Constitution after the Civil War. But the, um, the proclamation did spur people to all unite under the goal in the North, and for the, as far as the Union went, um, at, to end slavery. The Union decided ending slavery is one of our goals now. As we move through the South, we are going to free slaves. Where the Confederate was just trying to hang on to their slaves and maintain themselves as a new country. So, the Emancipation Proclamation was very important in terms of reestablishing the goal of the Civil War as freeing slaves as the Union was reunited. DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, contains all of the hereditary or genetic material in humans and most other organisms. So the DNA is what lets people know what genetic material is in a person or is in a certain creature or other organism. Now each cell in an organism has the same DNA. So if someone were to get a piece of your hair and a fingernail and a piece of skin and look at it very closely and look at the DNA, the DNA in all three would be the same and it would let whoever was looking at this know that all three of those articles came from the same person. This is the same for other organisms. Each cell in the organism's body is going to have the same DNA pattern so that you'll be able to tell that it came from the same creature. Most DNA is found in the nucleus of a cell. There is some DNA in the mitochondria, and then it is known as mitochondrial DNA, or it would look like this if you saw an abbreviation for it. So if you see the little MT before DNA in the abbreviation, that's because it's mitochondrial DNA and it's found in the mitochondria instead of the nucleus. But most DNA is going to be in the nucleus. Now, that important hereditary information found in DNA is stored as a code made up of four chemical bases. We've got adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And each one of those bases is only going to pair with one other base. They can't all pair up with any of the other three. So adenine pairs with thymine, and guanine pairs with cytosine to form base pairs. And a way that I remember that is that the ones with the straight lines in their abbreviation letter, the A and T that can be made with straight lines go together, and the ones that require a curved line go together. And that helps me remember that adenine pairs with thymine, these straight lines to form A and straight lines to form T, and guanine goes with cytosine because of the curve shape that it takes to make each of those abbreviation letters. The sequence of the adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine pairs determines how the organism builds and maintains itself. So it's important to think about this. Not every organism or every person is going to have the exact same sequence of base pairs. And you might think of the alphabet. We use 26 letters to form all of our words and sentences, but the way that they're arranged, the sequence of those letters is what lets us know what word is being communicated, what sentence is trying to be communicated, and each word has a different meaning even though it's made up of the same 26 letters or some um, subset of those letters. So it works the same way. You're going to have 
some sequence of adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, and those base pair sequence is going to let you know or let a scientist know what that organism does to maintain itself. What kind it is? Is it functioning properly? Is everything in the right order? What does that order tell us? The same way that seeing C-A-T tells us that that is the word cat. and It's talking about a mammal with pointy ears and whiskers and a tail that's kept as a pet. Let's look at the next part. Each base pair, so our adenine thymine pair or guanine cytosine pair, is going to attach to a sugar molecule and to a phosphate molecule. And once those attach, once a base pair attaches to the sugar molecule and phosphate molecule, it forms a nucleotide. And these nucleotides form two long strands that spiral into a double helix. That is the shape that DNA takes on. And I did my best to give you all an example of a double helix. It kind of spirals around. If you were to curl a ribbon around my pen, it would form that kind of double helix shape we're talking about. And you should think of a twisted ladder with the base pairs as rungs. So if we were looking at this picture here, this would be our double helix shape that's spiraling around and each one of these little rungs on the ladder would be a base pair. So we would have adenine and thymine together and they would be paired up. And then here you would have guanine and cytosine paired up. And then you would have adenine and thymine, guanine and cytosine, all the way down the ladder where you've got your sugar molecules and phosphate molecules that bound to your base pairs making up the sides of the ladder here and you just have this long DNA chain and then the sequence that you see is going to let you know how that organism builds and maintains itself because not every creature's DNA is going to be the same. Everyone has a very unique DNA pattern. DNA can replicate or make copies of itself by splitting the ladder in half. So if we're looking at this and we just decided to go through and cut this ladder in half, we would be separating those base pairs all the way down. So then you have A, G, A, G, and any other base pairs you've got. So we know we've got adenine and guanine, adenine and guanine, and because we know what's on one side of the ladder, each strand or half of that ladder serves as a pattern for duplicating bases. Since we know we've got adenine here, we know the thing that has to pair with it is thymine. If we've got guanine, cytosine has to pair with it. Since in DNA, adenine and thymine always pair together and guanine and cytosine pair together, you will know or the cell will know, okay, I've got this DNA, I've only got half of it, but it's a pattern. If I have adenine, I need to add thymine to the other side. If I've got cytosine, I need to add guanine to the other side. So the cell will know based on that half, that strand that it gets from DNA, how to make a complete DNA molecule and be able to form that double helix and complete the DNA strand. And each new cell needs an exact copy of DNA from the old cell. Because remember, each cell in an organism has the exact same DNA. So if the DNA is replicating itself, it needs to be giving an exact copy to a new cell so that this can continue and the organism is going to continue to have the same DNA in it. So you will see a lot about DNA in biology and it's important to remember that DNA is the hereditary or genetic material. It's usually found in the nucleus. And remember which bases pair with which. Your straight lines in adenine A pair with your straight lines in thymine T. And your curve G for guanine goes with your curve C for cytosine. DNA is the hereditary or genetic material that is usually found in the nucleus, sometimes in the mitochondria. Most important thing to remember is that it's where all the genetic material 
is going to be found. It's a big identifier for a cell or for a, an organism. Kingdom Animalia Animals have several characteristics that set them apart from other living things. Animals are eukaryotic and multicellular. So where other kingdoms can have creatures that are comprised of just one cell, animals are going to have more than one cell. They are also heterotropic. This means they cannot create their own food and must rely on other sources of nourishment. So they're going to eat other plants or animals. They're not going to be able to create their own food with sunlight like plants can. Animals do not have cell walls, but they may have an exoskeleton, which is like a hard skeleton they secrete onto the outside of their body, or a shell. Now, they don't have to have that. Obviously, we don't have a hard exoskeleton or a shell, but some animals like um, your crawfish or lobsters would have an exoskeleton or things like snails have a shell. All animals are motile. This means they can move even if only during certain stages of life. So some animals may only move a little bit or very slowly, but all animals are motile even if it's just for a short period of time or during one stage of their life. Nearly all animals undergo some form of sexual reproduction, but some animals are also capable of asexual reproduction. And this is possibly, and a lot of times, through parthenogenesis, which is when a fertilized egg is produced without any mating, budding, or fragmentation. So it is possible, but most of the time the animals are going to undergo sexual reproduction to produce offspring. Animalia is also known as metazoa, as far as a kingdom name goes, and it is divided into the subkingdoms Parazoa, which consist of sponges and trichoplax. Uh, sponges, I'm sure you can think of, but trichoplax kind of looks like a puddle you spilled on the floor. It's very flat, but it is still an animal. It does have differentiated cells. Uh, it even has some eye cells on it. So, parazoa, such as the sponges and trichoplax, have differentiated cells but no distinct tissue or tissues or body symmetry. So, they're kind of oddly shaped. Where most animals you would be able to see some symmetry, there is no symmetry as far as parazoa are concerned. Now, all other animals are put into the subkingdom Eumetazoa. And these have two or three distinct layers of cells with differentiated tissues and either radial or bilateral symmetry. And what that means is that you can divide them a certain way. If they have radial symmetry, you would be able to divide them any way, going in a circle, and the halves would match up. So a jellyfish would be an example of that. If you divided the jellyfish here, if you could divide it across here, if you could divide it across here, going any way in a circle around the top of the jellyfish, down across the top and down through all the tentacles, if you cut it, it would be more of a circular shape and anywhere you cut it, it would be the same on either side. So it's symmetrical. And it would have radial symmetry because there isn't just one symmetrical line you can cut along. There's not just one line of symmetry, there are several. The same goes with a starfish. You could cut it along a line going this way, 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 or a line going this way. If you go all along that circle, it can have symmetry. It can have all these different lines of symmetry, and what's on the other side of the line of symmetry is going to match what's on the first side of the line of symmetry. Bilateral symmetry, you can only divide the body in half one way. So people have bilateral symmetry. You can divide straight down 
from the top of your head to between your two feet and the two halves should match up pretty well at least as far as body type and tissues are concerned. So people have bilateral symmetry. You can divide straight down the middle and the halves should match up pretty well. Butterflies or moths are another example that should match up. Cats, dogs, a lot of animals display bilateral body symmetry. But there are some that have radial symmetry. But these are all eumetazoa. Remember the parazoa is not going to have any kind of body symmetry because it doesn't have distinct tissues and it is not going to have a distinct body shape every time. It's going to be different. So whenever you are thinking about kingdom animalia, remember these certain characteristics that set them apart. They're eukaryotic and multicellular, made of more than one cell. They are heterotrophic. They cannot make their own food and must receive nourishment from other sources. They do not have cell walls, but may have an exoskeleton or a shell. And all mo animals are motile. They are able to move, at least at some stage in their life. Meiosis. Sexual reproduction in eukaryotes involves a form of cell division known as meiosis. It has several different stages that are carried out to let one diploid germ cell result in four haploid gametes. And diploid means that it's going to have multiple copies of the genetic information where haploid means it's going to have one copy. So in this first part this would be interphase and it's kind of before meiosis starts but it has to do with it because this diploid germ cell contains genetic information from both a, a maternal and paternal parents. So you've got female and male genetic material in this one diploid germ cell and it's getting ready to divide to carry out sexual reproduction. So we have replication going on in here because each chromosome is going to double itself so that there's extra genetic material to carry out this process. In the next phase we have prophase and the replicated genetic material is going to line up in homologous pairs, which means that each one is the same genetic material. It's an exact copy. And they're going to cross over a little bit at these points here. And where those cross over, they kind of swap a little bit of genetic material. So each one of these pairs is going to take a little bit of the other pair. And that is called crossing over or recombination. So you're just kind of jumbling up the maternal and paternal bits before the um, division starts to take place. Then we move on to metaphase. And in metaphase, your centrosomes are starting to pull the homologous pairs apart. And then we move on to anaphase. And you can see they actually are getting pulled further apart. They're not crossing over anymore. And they're starting to move to opposite sides of the cell. And these are all prophase 1, metaphase 1, anaphase 1, because this is kind of a two-step process. Then we keep going, and we've got telophase 1. In telophase 1, there's the cleavage furrow. that's preparing for the cells to separate and become two distinct separate cells. There is a nucleus being reformed. The microtubules that have been connecting the chromosomes and pulling them apart have receded and the genetic material is encased in a nucleus again. And then this last part is cytokinesis 1 where the cytoplasm is split 
and there is a definite split made between those two cells, so now there are two diploid daughter cells. So we had our diploid germ cell, the DNA, the genetic material was all replicated, so there was twice as much. We went through this cell division, so now each one of these daughter cells is a diploid daughter cell, and it has uh, twice as much genetic material as it needs to be a haploid gamete. So we're going to go through what is known as meiosis II, the second step in this process. So we have prophase II. And in this phase, you'll see we've got the two daughter cells, and now they're kind of repeating the same process that happened up top. So there's no replication because that was an interphase but they are going to start having the centrosomes move down to either side and um, start moving out to opposite poles of the cell and start pulling the chromosomes that way. In the next phase, we've got metaphase 2. You can see that the Chromosomes have lined up along the equatorial plate in both of these daughter cells. The microtubules are connecting them to the centrosomes and they're going to start pulling apart. So in our next phase, anaphase 2, you can see that actually happen. The chromosome pairs have gotten pulled apart and now these individual chromatids are on separate sides of the cell and they're still going to be kind of being reeled in by the microtubules at this point. And we move on to telophase 2, where we've got a nucleus forming around our new pairs of genetic material that have both the um, mother and father genetic material in each nucleus. They're all split up now and we have the cleavage furrow again. The cells are getting ready to divide permanently. Your centrosomes have separated to the opposite side still and the microtubules have retracted. And then we go to cytokinesis 2, which is where the cytoplasm divided between these two new cells and these two new cells, and now we've got four haploid gametes, which means that they each just have one set of genetic information, and they're going to need a partner to be able to um, reproduce. So these gametes are going to be ready to be fertilized, and when they, they are fertilized, a diploid zygote will be formed. So these gametes are ready to be fertilized and if they are then they can go on to create a new eukaryotic organism. So meiosis does have a two-part process and it goes through the same phases as mitosis but they're a little bit different because instead of just getting an exact copy you're mixing genetic material from two different organisms, a maternal and paternal parent, and at the end you're going to have the four haploid gametes that each has genetic information from both parents. Rocks versus minerals. Let's look at a side-by-side -side comparison of rocks versus minerals so you can see the difference between the two. Rocks are aggregates of one or more minerals and they may also contain mineraloids and organic remains. Now mineraloids are minerals lacking a crystalline structure, so they don't have a definite crystalline structure Structure if they are mineraloids. And organic remains are going to be anything that came from a living thing. So um, if an animal died, then its body would eventually decay and be organic matter. Um, any kind of ex from an animal would be organic remains and so all of that also can form up rock. So a rock is an aggregate or a, com uh, com a combination of one or more minerals and it could contain mineraloids and it could contain organic remains. So there's no real set um, combination of what a rock is going to contain. 
and it has no definite structure or shape. So a rock doesn't have to have a certain structure. It doesn't have to look a certain shape, look like a certain shape whenever you find it. Rocks are more random. You're not going to find them looking the same way every time. Now minerals are naturally occurring inorganic solids. So nothing organic about them, nothing that came from a living creature or um, a person. And they have a definite chemical composition. So if you were to look at it, every atom of that mineral should have the same chemical composition and an orderly internal crystalline structure. Now some minerals may have the same chemical composition but have a different crystalline structure and the structure determines how it's going to look or what the mineral is going to be called sometimes whenever it has the same chemical composition. And let's see, so that's a mineral. A mineral at its basic point is a naturally occurring inorganic solid, so made naturally um, from the earth and it is not, it doesn't have anything that used to be alive. It has a definite chemical composition and a definite internal crystalline structure. So it's got to form the same way every time um, to be a, a specific mineral. And a polymorph is two minerals with the same chemical composition but a different crystalline structure. So this is what I was talking about, where sometimes, even though um, two minerals have the same chemical composition, they won't look the same because their crystalline structure is different. And at that basic atomic level, if the crystalline structure is different, what you're able to see with the naked eye is going to appear different. And even if it looks like two different minerals, um, it isn't going to be the exact same. It will be a polymorph of the other because it doesn't have the same crystalline structure, even though it has the same chemical composition. So rocks are more random. They don't have to have a definite structure. They don't have to have a definite chemical composition or makeup. It can be made of any combination of minerals, um, mineraloids and organic matter. Minerals are going to have a definite chemical composition and an orderly internal crystal structure. So they are uh, more specific. They have to have a definite uh, composition and structure to them where rocks do not have to have that. Now, rock types are igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. So these are the three rock types that a rock could be classified as. And rocks are classified into one of these three types based on their formation and the minerals they contain. So how were they formed and what are they formed of? When you know those two things, you can classify your rock as igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic. Minerals are classified by their chemical composition. So you look and see what chemicals it's made up of, what exact atoms make up that mineral at a chemical level, at the tiniest level, and that's how they're going to be classified. Rocks are classified by how they are formed. Are they formed from stress? Are they formed from heat? Are they formed from organic matter? Those kind of things are going to affect how a rock is classified, but that doesn't matter for a mineral. And lastly, the study of rocks is known as petrology. And the study of minerals is known as mineralogy. And side note, geology is the study of earth as it pertains to the composition, structure, and origin of its rocks. So, rocks are classified based on their formations and what minerals are in the rock. Minerals are classified by their chemical composition. At that basic root level, what are they made up of? 
Petrology is the study of rocks. Mineralogy is the study of minerals. Rocks are more random. They don't have a definite structure. They're made up of um, one or many different minerals plus mineraloids and organic matter. Minerals are more specific. They have to have a definite chemical composition and a definite crystalline structure. The solar system consists of the sun and the eight major planets that orbit around it. So first we have the sun, and then I'm going to order the eight major planets in order of how close they are to the sun. So we start out with Mercury, then Venus, then the third from the sun is Earth, then we have Mars, and then in between Mars and the next planet we have an asteroid belt. And then after that asteroid belt is Jupiter, and then Saturn, Uranus, then Neptune. Now you may be thinking Pluto should come after Neptune. Well, Pluto is no longer considered to be a planet. Now it's considered to be, or it's classified as one of the five known trans-Neptunian objects regarded as minor planets. So then after Neptune we have the Kuiper Belt. And so this Kuiper Belt extends from about 30 astronomical units from Neptune to about 50 astronomical units. So an astronomical unit is the distance from the sun to the earth, and so that's 150 million kilometers. So the Kuiper Belt extends from Neptune at 30 astronomical units out to about 50 astronomical units. So that's a total of one light year, or 9.5 trillion kilometers from the sun. And so this contains countless numbers of icy bodies of water, methane, and ammonia, some with rocky cores. Now beyond the Kuiper Belt lies the hypothesized spherical Oort cloud, thought to be the source of long period comets. So that's the Oort cloud. And so there's eight major planets, so I'm going to put a check mark next to those. And again, these are in order from the distance they orbit the sun. So notice here that if you remember any kind of certain phrase to remember the order of the planets, notice that there's two M's, and so Mercury is the closest to the Sun, and then Mars is after Earth. But all the other planets start with different letters. So the order is Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Illusion. Illusion is an unsighted but recognizable reference to something else. Usually it's going to be a reference to something else in literature. Authors use allusions to make their own text richer. When an author uses an allusion, it gives their own writing the same significance or context that the allusion had. Let's look at some examples. Martin Luther King Jr. started his I Have a Dream speech by saying five score years ago this is a clear allusion to President Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Lincoln started with four score and seven years ago. So, even though Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't saying the exact same thing, he started out with five score years ago, which is similar enough that people knew he was alluding to President Lincoln's speech. This reminded people of the significance of the event. And in reminding people of the significance of the Gettysburg Address, it lent significance to the speech that Martin Luther King was making. Let's look at some, some other examples. Scrooge. If someone is alluded to as Scrooge, or there's a Scrooge reference in writing, it's going to be someone who is not very generous. They're kind of miserly. They don't like to share. And that would be something that you would have seen in A Christmas Carol. 
where he goes around and sees what his life would be like if he weren't there and realizes to change his ways. But Scrooge was a very miserly man who didn't want to share with people who really needed it. If you see Pinocchio, it's a reference to someone who is lying. If you see a Trojan horse, it means someone who, or something that is a trick. It looks like the real thing, but really there's a trap concealed inside. An Achilles heel is a reference to Achilles from Greek mythology, and his heel was his one weak spot. So your Achilles heel would be your weak spot where someone could really get to you. A Romeo from Romeo and Juliet. Romeo would be someone who was really good with women, someone who really loved to, you know, take girls out on dates and was really good at, you know, getting girls to go out on dates with them. Turn the other cheek is a biblical reference when Jesus told people that they shouldn't seek revenge but should instead turn the other cheek if they're slapped once. Turn the other cheek so you can get hit on the other side of your face. And it's just his metaphor for saying, don't seek revenge. That's not the Christian way. Solomon is another biblical reference. He was a very wise king. So if you're referred to as um, someone who's like Solomon, it means you've got a lot of wisdom. And a good Samaritan is another biblical reference, and it refers to the good Samaritan on the road who helped someone when no one else would. So a good Samaritan today is someone who helps people or helps a person that no one else is trying to help. So allusions can be used to ground text in a particular time or place, or they can use a cultural reference to make readers feel included. There are lots of reasons that a writer would use allusions, but every time that you use an allusion, it's meant to make your text richer and give your text more than it had before. So when you're reading, watch for allusions. And if you see one of these references, say to yourself, oh, that's an allusion. I learned about those. It's here to make the text richer. And think to yourself, what connotations do you get? How do you feel differently reading that word in the text? What did that word or reference do for your interpretation of the text? Because really, that's what allusion is there for. It's to add to the text and make it better. There are two scenarios when it is appropriate to use a colon. The first is before items in a series. Now, there's two tests that you can conduct to see if it is appropriate to use a colon before items in a series. The first is check to see if you can replace a colon with the word namely. The second test is to make sure that there is a complete sentence before the colon or an independent clause. If the scenario fails either of these tests, then most likely you should not use a colon in that instance. So this example sentence says, I enjoy playing many sports, basketball, volleyball, and baseball. So notice there's a colon before the items in a series. So let's see if we can, re can replace the colon with the word namely. I enjoy playing many sports, namely basketball, volleyball, and baseball. That makes sense. That sounds grammatically correct. So it passes that test. And then we need to make sure all these words before the colon make up an independent clause. And an independent clause is just a group of words that can stand alone. I enjoy playing many sports. That can stand alone. That could be a sentence by itself. So it passes both of those tests, so we know that it's appropriate to use a colon here. Generally, if it passes one of these tests, then it's going to pass the other as well. The second example says, be sure to bring a pencil, paper, and a calculator. Now, should we use a colon here? Because we have items in a list, so we could put a colon right there. Now, could we replace that colon with the word namely? Be sure to bring namely a pencil, paper, and a calculator. That doesn't sound grammatically correct, so we shouldn't put a colon there. And then if you wanted to look at the second test as well, you could notice that be sure to bring is not an independent clause. So 
In this case, you don't need to use a colon, and the sentence is grammatically correct without one. Now, the second instance in when it's okay to use a colon is between two independent clauses. Now, this is not a very common way to use a colon, but nevertheless, it is still an appropriate way to use one. So, if you have two independent clauses, you can join them with a colon. And so, again, an independent clause is a group of words that can stand alone. So, Caitlin can cook many desserts is a sentence, and she can make cookies, brownies, and cakes is a sentence. So, they're both independent clauses that we're joining with a colon. And so, this is an appropriate case in which to use one. But again, you're usually not going to see this. Usually, there would just be a period here, or maybe a semicolon, or maybe a comma and some type of conjunction. So, those are the two times to use a colon with items in a series or between independent clauses. Context. Sometimes when you're reading and you come across a word that you don't know, you can use context clues to make an educated guess as to what the word means. Now when you're looking at the word you don't know, you don't want to just look right before and after the word. You usually want to look at the sentence before and the sentence after. And sometimes you even have to look at the whole paragraph to get an idea of what that unfamiliar word means. Now, there are some clues that we can look at to help determine what the word means. One thing you can look at is a description. Sometimes a sentence or a sentence following or before the unfamiliar word will give you a description. For instance, the green feathered macaw. Well, you may not know the word macaw, but by seeing green feathered, you can infer that it is some kind of a bird with green feathers. Another clue you can look at are synonyms. If you hear the soft and supple leather, well, since you have soft here and then supple, both describing leather, you can figure out that supple probably has something to do with being soft. And in reality, it means moldable. It's easily moldable. And it is somewhat soft to be able to do that. We'll go ahead and note that this one was our bird. Now another clue you can look for are antonyms. Angie is sweet. She doesn't have a malevolent bone in her body. Well, you may not know what malevolent means, but you probably know what sweet means. And if she isn't malevolent and she is sweet, then you can figure out malevolent is something bad, something negative, the opposite of sweet. And in reality, malevolent means evil. Another clue you can look for are definitions. Sometimes the sentence before, after, or part of the same sentence your word is in will just give you the definition of the word. For instance, the echidna, an egg-laying mammal native to Australia, and then they might tell you some interesting fact about the echidna. Well, in commas, right after echidna is the definition of an echidna, an egg-laying mammal native to Australia. So you know what it is right there. The last clue you can look for is tone. Is the rest of this paragraph positive, negative, happy, scared? If you have a paragraph that's all one tone, then the word probably has something to do with that. If it's a scary tone, then this may be a word that it has to do with something scary. If it's positive, it may be a happy kind of word. So you can always take that into consideration whenever you are taking your educated guess. So once you've looked at clues and you've tried to figure out looking before and after the sentence your word is in, looking at the whole paragraph, seeing if you can find a description, a synonym, an antonym, a definition, or figure out the tone surrounding that unfamiliar word, you want to take a guess as to what the word means. And then you want to reread the sentence to see if it makes sense to you and ask yourself, does it make sense? So if we were to insert bird here, the green feathered bird. Well, if it's something that has feathers and we have bird after it, that makes sense. So that one would work. The soft and supple leather. So if we know it means something else soft, maybe moldable, we could say the soft and moldable leather, the soft and flexible leather. Any kind of word like that that you put in that was similar to soft would work. It would make sense in your sentence. Okay. 
We were thinking evil here, something the opposite of sweet. Angie is sweet. She doesn't have an evil bone in her body. That makes sense. She is sweet. She doesn't have an evil bone. Now, the echidna sentence is a little different. If they plug in a definition for you, then it's a little harder to check. You would just say, an egg-laying mammal native to Australia, and then maybe tell the sentence after that point because the definition's already there for you. There's not really a synonym for echidna or anything else you could have come up with for what that one meant. And once you've checked to make sure they all make sense, then you have a pretty good idea of what that word means. And you can see how using these context clues of looking for a description, a synonym, an antonym, a definition, or the tone of a paragraph can help you figure out that pesky, unfamiliar word. Figurative language. Figurative language is language that goes beyond the literal meaning of a word. And authors will use figurative language to enhance their writing. Some common examples of figurative language are hyperbole, simile, metaphor, and personification. So we'll discuss each of those and I'll give you some examples for each. Hyperbole is exaggeration. People will say something and you aren't meant to take it literally. You're meant to know it's an exaggeration, but it's there just to emphasize how strongly the author is trying to convey something. For instance, I've told you a million times. I bet some of you have probably heard that one. And a million times, really, probably you haven't heard whatever your parent or teacher has said they've told you a million times. It's an exaggeration. It's hyperbole. It's meant to emphasize that they've already told you this a lot more times before now. Another example would be, I had a ton of homework. You did not literally go home with 2,000 pounds of homework, but you're telling people, I had a lot of homework. It was way more than the normal amount. It was a ton. It was that much homework. So that's what hyperbole is, exaggeration. Next, we've got simile, which is comparing two things using like or as. And this is very important. You have to use those words like or as or it's not going to be a simile anymore. So, the child howled like a coyote. We see our word like. You're comparing two things in this sentence. The child howled like a coyote compares the child to a coyote using the word like. This example is letting you know that the child is loud. It's crying sounds like a howl, much like a coyote. So this figurative language is used to bring a coyote to mind to help you picture and hear in your mind how this child is screaming or crying. Next, let's look at this example. She ran as fast as lightning. Well, that's going to compare two things here, and we see the word as. So what is being compared in this sentence? She ran as fast as lightning. And usually when you have one as, you've got two. So it's comparing she, or a girl, to lightning. And that is being done by using the word as. So when you're comparing a girl to lightning, you're saying she's that fast. It went so fast you barely got to see her before she got past you or got to the finish line. So it's just letting you know she's really, really fast. So that's what simile is, comparing two things using like or as. And again, these are the important words to look for to make it actually be a simile. It could be a metaphor, which compares two things without using like or as. And that is really the big difference between a simile and a metaphor. A simile uses like or as, a metaphor does not use like or as. 
So let's look at some metaphor examples. She was lightning running down the track. So this sentence is very similar to this one. They're both comparing she or a girl to lightning. They're both saying this girl is really fast. But this one just says she was lightning. She was lightning running down the track. It doesn't say she ran as fast as lightning. It doesn't use like or as. It just says she was lightning. So it's a different way to use the same kind of figurative language. So that's one example of a metaphor. Let's look at this. And this is an excerpt from Edgar Allan Poe's poem, The Raven. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. Now this one's a little trickier because it doesn't just come out and say this was this or this is this. Like here it said she was lightning. But it says that his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. So we're comparing his eyes to a demon's eyes which is basically comparing him or a man to a demon. If his eyes are like a demon's eyes, then this man is being compared to a demon, which is to maybe say that the man is evil. It doesn't mean he's literally a demon. It means he's got some characteristic of a demon. He's maybe an evil person. So in poetry, your figurative language may not always pop out at you if it's a metaphor. A simile is pretty easy to spot because you'll see like or as. But a metaphor might be a little trickier. So just look for what two things are being compared in that sentence or that phrase of a poem. And the last piece of figurative language we're going to discuss is personification which is when an inanimate object is given human qualities. You are personifying it. You are making it do something a person would do even though it's not something that can do these things. And remember, inanimate objects are going to be things that are not alive. A chair, a teapot, the wind, water, those are inanimate objects. So the example here, the water slapped the side of the boat. The water slapped. Can water actually slap like a person would slap? No, but it makes you think of the action of slapping and the sound you might hear with the slap whenever you picture this water slapping the side of the boat. And that's why they're using this particular word and personifying the water. Depending on what the story is about where this sentence appears, it could be that the water is being made as like a, an evil character. If someone drowns in this story, then the water would be seen as an enemy. And so it slapping the side of the boat would give it that negative feeling. Another example, the teapot shrieked. Shrieking, screaming, that loud sound, you can hear it in your head when you think about the noise a teapot makes. But a teapot isn't actually shrieking like a person would. It's simply making that noise because the air is hot enough that it's trying to get out now. Or the wind howled. Wind can't howl like a wolf would howl, but wind makes that same kind of sound sometimes, and so the author is trying to put that sound of howling in your mind when they're describing the wind. So figurative language can be a lot of different things. Hyperbole, where you're exaggerating. Simile, where you're comparing two things using like or as. Very important markers for a simile. Metaphor, where you're comparing two things without using like or as. And personification, when an object is given human qualities, whenever it's personified. And all of these techniques are used so that the words will go beyond the literal meaning of them and give you a deeper understanding of the poem or the work that you're reading. The author is trying to go beyond the words and make you really think about their meaning and put certain connotations in your head whenever you're reading. A comma is there for the purpose of breaking the flow of text. So basically we could define the job of commas as to break the flow of text. So commas should come in places and sentences 
where we would naturally pause if we were speaking that sentence. And so one way to test whether or not a comma is necessary is to pause very deliberately at each comma when reading. Because it's important not to overuse commas because they lose their effect if they're used in places that they should not be. So it's important to know when commas are needed and when they're not needed, both for your own writing and maybe if you're revising someone else's work. So let's practice. Right here we have a sentence that says, as you can see, the car is very old. But we have a comma right here. So if you're just reading this to yourself inside your head, you may have trouble determining whether or not the comma is needed. So try reading it out loud and deliberately stopping at the comma. As you can see, the car is very old. Well, that makes sense because if you were speaking this, you would be explained to someone and you would say, as you can see, the car is very old. So the comma there is needed. Another example is this sentence right here. Natural disasters, such as tornadoes, hurricanes, and earthquakes, are not very common here. So here we have three commas. Excuse me, we actually have four commas. And so two of these commas are there for the purpose of setting off this phrase, and the other two commas are there because we're making a list. So first, let's look at, take a look at the phrase. Natural disasters, such as tornadoes, hurricanes, and earthquakes, are not very common here. So really, we could omit everything in between these two commas and just say natural disasters are not very common here. So that's why we're using commas here, because we could set this off. But if you were speaking this, you would say natural disasters, such as tornadoes, hurricanes, and earthquakes, are not very common here. So both of those commas are needed. Now when you're reading the list, such as tornadoes, hurricanes, and earthquakes, you don't really need to pause in between each item in the list. But here the commas aren't here as much to break the flow of text. In this case, they're just distinguishing between the different items in the list. So this is kind of an exception of when you wouldn't follow the rules of commas are only there to break the flow of text. But in general, hopefully you can see kind of a better idea of when to use commas. So where the check marks are, those were all the correct places to use commas. And then right there and right there as well. You just want to make sure that you use commas when you need them. And if in doubt, didn't, then generally leave the comma. But many times you want to leave out commas when you can because they slow down your writing. Because someone feels like they need to mentally pause if they're speaking, they need to actually pause when reading that comma. And so make sure your, your comma usage is appropriate. Theme. Theme is the overall idea of a piece of literature. So think about the lesson or moral of the story that the author is trying to get across to you. One thing to remember is do not confuse theme with plot. Plot is what the characters do. It's the action of the story. It does not have to do with the overall lesson or message that the author is getting across. Now obviously what the characters do is going to help you understand the theme, but plot and theme are not the same thing. Plot is going to be more about human nature, society, and life in general. There can also be more than one theme. The author may have one overall message, but there may be a few messages in there, or you may be able to find more than one theme besides the main controlling theme of the story. Some questions to ask yourself are, what is the lesson or message? And some common themes are, man struggles against society, man struggles against nature, overcoming adversity, the importance of family and friendship, man struggles with faith, sacrifices bring rewards, and honesty is the best policy. So, for all of these, I want us to look at the story of the tortoise and the hare from Aesop's Fables. And this shows you that there can definitely be more than one theme for one story. Now, all of these may not be what Aesop had in mind when he was coming up with this fable, but I was able to see all of these themes in the story. The last one, I couldn't come up with something for, but I've got a good one for that as well. So man struggles against society. You've got this tortoise who feels like 
he's going to keep going and he's going to try to win the race, but all of society is against him and saying, oh, that hare has got you beat. He's way faster than you. I don't know why you think you're fast enough to beat him. So I'm sure that tortoise was struggling against society's views of him. Another one would be man struggle against nature. The tortoise is struggling against the nature of his self, how he's made. He's obviously not going to be as fast as the hare. Um, he's going to have to go up hills. He's going to be fighting against the very nature of his self where the hare is made to go much faster. Overcoming adversity. Just simply winning the race, the tortoise ended up winning even though no one expected him to do it, even though people were probably telling him, oh, you can't do that, the hare's always going to beat you. The importance of family and friendship. Now, I've talked a lot about society telling the tortoise he couldn't do this, but I'd like to think that the tortoise had some family and friends on his side that were urging him on, that helped him feel like he could actually go through and win this race. Man struggles with faith. The tortoise had to have faith in himself. The hare was very, very cocky. He felt like he had this race won so much so that he went and took a nap where the tortoise didn't do that. He had faith in himself and knew that he could do this if he just kept going, if he gave it his all. And then sacrifices bring rewards. The tortoise sacrificed that nap that the hare took and in the end he won the race because he just kept going. Now, the moral of the story they give you is slow and steady wins the race, but I can see all of these themes in that story. Now, honesty is the best policy. I couldn't really come up with one for, but you can always look at Pinocchio. Pinocchio, every time he told a lie, his nose grew. It was not a good thing. Every time he lied, something bad happened to him. I won't ruin the whole story for you, but everyone knows about the growing nose, which is a sad punishment for someone who is not using honesty. So it's showing you honesty is the best policy. So whenever you're reading a story, you can look at what the characters are doing to figure out what the plot is, but remember the theme is different. The theme is going to be the controlling idea in that piece of literature. And you want to ask yourself, what is the lesson or moral the author is trying to get across to me? In this video, we want to go over prefixes. Prefixes are short little sections of words that come before the root of a word and help you understand what the word means. They add uh, an extra nuance to the word. And why prefixes and suffixes, for that matter, are important, prefixes coming before the root of the word, suffixes, short little endings after the word, is that if you know your basic prefixes and suffixes, they help you determine the meaning of a word. And they're important clues, especially if you're taking a standardized test where they say we want you to find the word with the opposite meaning. Sometimes just knowing the prefix can give you enough of a clue, even if you don't know what the root means, to find the opposite. Um, we've got a few examples on the board and we want to go through those briefly just to show you the importance of prefixes, how they can help you in your test taking strategies, and how they can help you understand the meanings of words. So prefixes give clues as to a word's meaning. Knowing them can help you find the word with the opposite meaning on a test. So words like uh, prefixes like pre, um, here we think pre-operative, pre-op, that means before the operation, or prescient. Uh, pre meaning before and scient from the word science which means knowledge so to know ahead of time so prescient is to know ahead of time uh, pre game show the, the part that comes before the game so pre means before the opposite of pre is post post operative care the care that happens after the operation post game show the show that happens after the game so pre is before post is after if you realize this um, opposites, then if you see a word that's got a pre-prefix on it, then you look for a word with a post-prefix on it if the test is asking you to find the opposite. Another thing would be pro and d. So pro means for, as in pro-life. Uh, someone who is pro-life is for life. Um, uh, de is the negation, so deconstruction. To deconstruct is the opposite of uh, or the negation of construction. Construction to build up, deconstruct to destroy. So pro uh, meaning for, D is uh, usually a negation, pre before, 
uh, post after. Knowing your prefixes can be critical, um, especially if you're not sure of the whole word. You can say, well, let me break this word up into its prefix, its root, and its suffix, and see if I can't uh, decode just from that minimal information the proper answer on the other side. Now, obviously, when you're taking a test, if you know the right answer, you always go with the right answer. But if you're struggling, if you're not sure, this is a strategy you can use. You can look at the word, break it down, and say, hmm, here's the prefix, and I know it means this, and I'm being asked to find the opposite. What's the opposite of this prefix? Then I've got my answer more than likely. Caution, though. Caution. Con and pro are opposites, but Congress is not the opposite of progress, although some people might disagree. Uh, that's more of a joke in terms of Congress being the opposite of progress, but uh, con and pro are opposites, but you have to know and be careful sometimes. Anyway, that's been just a basic introduction and uh, overview of the importance of prefixes as a test-taking strategy of knowing what they mean uh, to help you determine the meaning of a word and also to assist you if you're being asked to look for the opposite. If you know what the prefix means and you know what the opposite of that prefix is, it makes it a snap to find the right answer. If you'd like to learn more about this or related matters, underneath this video you'll see a link. If you'll click on that link, it'll take you to the website that has that information. While you're on that website, you'll also find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download. Pronouns replace nouns. This sentence says, Dad is at his office. We could also say, He is at his office. These two sentences have the same meaning because he replaces dad, but they're both talking about the same person. Now, when dealing with pronouns, you have something called an antecedent. An antecedent is the noun that a pronoun replaces. So here, dad is the antecedent, because later we have this pronoun he, which replaces dad. Now there are many pronouns, so I'm going to go ahead and list most of those. I, you, he, she, it, we, they, me, you, him, her, it, us, them, my, your, his, her, it's, our, their, mine, yours, his, hers, ours, theirs, myself, herself, ourselves, and himself. So those are a list of pronouns that you're probably pretty familiar with. So notice here, his is also a pronoun. So dad is the antecedent for both his and he. Now, why do we use antecedents? Why don't we just always use that noun? Well, take a look at this example. Tom plays soccer. Tom is very athletic. It's kind of redundant or annoying to say Tom every time. So instead, we can replace Tom, which is now an antecedent for he. Tom plays soccer. He is very athletic. Because we just mentioned Tom, we know who he is talking about. Now again, you always need an antecedent because if we said he plays soccer, he is very athletic, we don't know who he is. So you need an antecedent. You need that noun first and then from there you can use pronouns. Now as soon as you talk about someone else, as soon as you use a, a new noun, you need to use that noun again before you use a pronoun. So we could say, Tom plays soccer. He is very athletic. Sam plays soccer too. Now if we were to say, he likes basketball, then who would he stand for? He right here is, an ant, or is a pronoun. And so what's the antecedent? Are we talking about Sam or are we talking about Tom? Most likely, people are going to think you're talking about Sam because that's the last noun you used. So if you were talking about Tom, then you would need to actually use his name right here. So pronouns only work as long as there is only 
one noun in the picture. As soon as you use a new noun, you need to use that old noun again before you can use an antecedent. Now look at this sentence, people should wash its cars. You want to make sure your pronouns agree with your noun. You want to make sure they agree with their antecedent. So here, people is the antecedent, its is the pronoun. But they chose the wrong pronoun here. This should say their cars. Because when we use the word its, that's a singular form. It's like they're referring to one person. But here, since we're talking about people, we're talking about lots of people, or you know, more than one person, we need to use the pronoun there because that's plural. That refers to more than one person. So again, that's a quick look at pronouns. And pronouns replace nouns. It is important to use different types of sentences. Using different types of sentences adds variety to your writing. So by using different types of sentences, you make your writing more interesting. It's more appealing to the reader. So there's three types of sentences. There's the simple sentence, complex sentence, and the compound sentence. So you want to try to use all types of sentences in your writing. So a simple sentence is just a subject and a verb. This is what we'd call one independent clause. Hannah ran through the meadow. So we have the subject here, and we have the verb ran. And so that's all that's here. It's just a complete thought. It's enough to be a sentence, but it's not anything more. Then we have a complex sentence, which is an independent and a dependent clause. So I call this an independent clause because it can stand alone. It has a subject and a verb, so it's a sentence. It doesn't need anything else to make it more of a sentence. And so this says, instead of watching a movie, he read a book. So here we have a subject, he, and a verb, read. Now, he read a book could be a sentence alone. So that's the independent clause. The dependent clause is instead of watching a movie. Because instead of watching a movie isn't a sentence. I couldn't just come up to you and say, instead of watching a movie, you'd be thinking, OK, instead of watching a movie, what are you going to do? So this is the dependent clause. So together, the independent clause and the dependent clause form a complex sentence. And then we have a compound sentence, which is two independent clauses. So here we have the sentence, we ate burgers. So we have the subject, we, and the verb, ate. And then, then we ate burgers, or then we ate dessert. So we have we as the subject and ate as the verb again. But these are two sentences. These are two independent clauses. Because both of these clauses could be sentences by themselves. I could come up to you and say, we ate burgers. And that would be a complete thought. Or I could say, then we ate dessert. That would be a complete thought. So by joining these two together, we're forming one sentence. But we're forming one sentence out of what could be two sentences. So that's two independent clauses, which makes a compound sentence. So when you use all of these, it gives your writing variety. It makes your writing more interesting. And also, by using different types of sentences, it makes your sentence length differ as well. So generally, your simple sentences are going to be kind of short. And sometimes your complex or compound sentences will be pretty long. And so by having different links to your sentences, it makes your writing more interesting.